Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, this is one more of our series of lectures that have been organized by the Mechanical Engineering Sectional Committee of the ESL. Uh, our intention has been, particularly this year, to uh, provide opportunities not only for our own members but for the members of the public as well to uh, gain knowledge or on, on, on topics of interest both related to engineering as much as possible but definitely not limited to that uh, topics of uh, general interest so I think the topic we are started to select today is very very uh, important in that respect and where everybody else Brody has been having an interest on that one. So, uh, I would like to uh, welcome you again for coming for this lecture. And may I request uh, Asit, my friend Asit, to introduce the speaker today. Thank you, sir. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Asit Jaratna, a member of the Mechanical Engineering Section Committee of the IESL. It's my privilege to welcome you on behalf of the Mechanical Engineering Sectional to, sectional to this evening. Uh, today's public lecture will be delivered by Professor Charita Patiara Chief on the topic of search for missing flight MH370 oceanographic cruise. So, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Charita Patiara Chief and uh, their family members for this public lecture uh, and also the audience view. Professor Chatta Patiarachi is Professor of Coastal Oceanography at the University of Western Australia. He leads the University of Western Australia Coastal Oceanographic Group and the Australian National Facility for Oce Ocean Gliders. The research programs he has developed integrate ocean observation, numerical modeling and synthesis to define the role of physical processes in the coastal ocean and the development of coastal engineering solutions to local environmental problems. Further, Professor Patiarachi is playing a leading role on the Australian side which is engaging in finding the missing Malaysian airplane. So, ladies and gentlemen, please join me to welcome our invited presenter today, Professor Charita Patiarachi, to deliver his public lecture. Thank you. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, everyone. Hopefully, I will keep you entertained for the next 45 minutes or so. So, I'm going to talk about a very simple uh, concept. How do we trace parcels of water? Okay. So here we are looking at, you can imagine something which might be some oil, maybe a whole lot of people fell over, there might be a ship went around the ground, really some plastic or any buoyant material. So that's really what we're trying to do. We are trying to trace these pieces and parcels of water and what we may be transported with. And we have been doing this for a lot of time. So the search for MH370, I will come to at the end, but I will give you a, a flavor of what we use, the same techniques in different parts of the system. Okay. And before we go, I would like to uh, acknowledge Dr. Sarath Vijayak, some of you probably know him. Uh, and in fact, most of the modeling in the computer, he has uh, is what he has done that uh, we, we get to do. So in this one again, this is Western Australia, we actually release some particles again and you see with time how they disperse with the currents and the prevailing system. We also uh, would like to acknowledge the, the computer centre uh, that provides a lot of the computing power to follow these systems. But it's not only, as I said, I'll come to MH370 early, uh, a little bit later on. Um, we use it for a whole number of different um, uh, applications. 
So this is uh, Fremantle. Our university is just about here. It's an island called Rocknest Island. A few years ago, a little girl, about 12 years old, she was walking on the beach and she picked up a black bag and it had a human head in it. So obviously it was a drug deal which had gone wrong and uh, there was conjecture from the police. So that's where that head was found and the police said that it actually originated from this particular area. But knowing the oceanography, knowing our modeling, we could actually work backwards to say where it may have come from. If it actually came from that point, it would have not come here, it would have actually gone along the coastline and would have missed that particular island. But what we actually said that it would have originated much further to the south and lo and behold, when the, po uh, the police started looking at that location, they actually found the house where the murder has taken place and they have evidence. So it's a sort of an illustration of how the same techniques that we're going to use. So the other one that we can do is also not only uh, uh, look at particles, we can actually give velocities to particles. So again, we have an island, we have the mainland here, and in this line, you can't actually see in this image. In the background, you have lots of arrows, and that's our prediction for a swim. So the swim is from here to the mainland. It's 20 kilometers long. Just to give you an idea, between Sri Lanka and India is 30 kilometers. Okay. So it's two thirds away to, um, and then this is an annual swim, and we predict the current. So swimmers can actually predict and chart their way from the mainland to the system. And this particular one, I have actually predicted those red points to being a track to follow. So after the race, here you can see the same red dots and the white dots is where the students will go through. Okay. So now, to show that I practice what I teach, and preach. I actually did this swim two months ago. And so two kilometer, uh, 20 kilometers across, and we predict the current to actually do that. So that's my uh, claim to fame, if you like. So again, what we're doing is we may have currents, so these arrows actually show velocities of the currents, and we may actually have a particle or piece of debris which is actually moving with the system. On the other hand, we may have a piece of dye or some oil, which not only is moved by the currents, it also disperses and the patch gets bigger with time. So these are a very basic thing that we want to, to look at. But to, although it's very simple, we need to take into account because we're looking at the interface between the atmosphere and the ocean. So we want to now all of the systems which happen in the atmosphere, so the winds, uh, the, the rainfall, etc. And if you're looking at in the coastal areas, the runoff and precipitation, and in the ocean, we want to know the effect of the currents, the ocean currents, and the winds and how they reflect. So we actually use global models which use all of these and input into our models. So to give you an example, this is this morning. So you can see Sri Lanka here, India, the southwest monsoon. So we are, this is Western Australia, and we see the global wind field at this time. And we can zoom in, in, in if you want to look at more uh, importantly around Sri Lanka. So here you see the, the, the winds coming from the, the west, and you can actually see our highlands in the middle is having a shadow effect on the eastern coast. So these are the I inputs that we put into our models to predict where these parcels of water may be going. So what we first look at is the environmental forcing. We need to know what is the wind field. We need to know what are the tides. If we are in a coastal area, we want to know how much rivers are flowing into the, water, into the ocean and how much heat is exchanged with the atmosphere. 
So, in, for all of those, we have some response from the ocean. We can have the wind waves, so the winds generate waves, and that generates what we call a stoke strips, and I'll explain this um, in, in a little while. We have winds which generate the actual action of the wind on the particles that we're talking about, or objects. The winds create vertical mixing, the tides and the wind actually creates the currents which move these objects along with and the top of the ocean. So what we're doing is we take an atmospheric model, we put it into a wave model and an ocean circulation model, we combine all of that into a particle tracking model. Okay, so that's a basic computing module that we are looking at. So let's first look at the wind. The wind acts on the sea surface. There's a, a, a logarithmic change uh, profile. What we're really interested in is, is the first one meter of the surface. Okay, so one meter of the surface and the effect of the wind in that system. But if you have, let's say, lots of plastics or something which is always buoyant, if there's low wind, they would be on the surface. If it's a, a storm, they would be mixed through the water column. And we have to take that into account if we are looking at things like plastic or, say, looking at dispersion of oil. The effect of the waves, as the waves move through the ocean, the particles of water move in the same direction very slowly, and they also have that same feature as you see in the direct action of the wind. So, to summarize that, the surface wind, due to the wind, is about 2 or 3 percent on the speed of the wind. The, uh, we also take into account the Earth's rotation and the Stokes drift, the effect of the waves, is again roughly 3 percent. These are sort of rule of thumb, but we in our models calculate this a lot more effectively. Then we have a thing called the windage. So we're looking at an object and the windage defines how much of the wind acts on the object that we are looking at directly. So if our object is, lowing, is very much low in the water and is not exposed to the air, there is no windage because the wind is not acting on it. So if we have, let's say, half of it open, then we may have medium, and if it's actually on the surface, we will have high windage. So if you have, let's say, a cork bottle, it will actually skip on the ocean surface, it will not, it will have very high windage, it will more be acted by the effect of the wind as opposed to the effect of the ocean. So, that's the windage. The next one is what we call the divergence. And the divergence is when the wind is blowing, which way does our object move? And this we don't know. It can go to the left, it can go to the right. So, this is one of the most unknown part of our science because it depends on the, uh, on the actual object itself. So if you're looking at, let's say, search and rescue, and if you actually say we had something, hap an object happen here, an incident, we could actually, 12 hours later, could be in completely two different directions. So I tell this, when I, I do this talk sometimes to school kids, you're not school kids, but I'm going to ask you the same question. Let's say that we all went to the beach and we all wear our rubber slippers and we all left it on the beach and we went, went to the beach and came back and the sea has come and taken all our slippers away. Where would you find the slippers? If I ask you a general question. They will go offshore and they will come back. Do you think there's a difference of where they come back? Would you like to guess or you've heard? You will find that if you go to the rock, doesn't matter which way, some on one side of the beach, you will only find right-footed slippers. On the other side, 
you will only find left footed students. And that is because of this window. So there's places in the world that you actually walk in and you will only find slippers which are left footed or shoes. Often what they have is ships which cross the Pacific, they lose container full of Nike shoes and when they end up on the beaches you only find the right foot ones ending up on particular beaches, left footed ones ending up at the beaches. When I give this I had an interview on radio, it just happened to be on 1st of April. And when I gave this talk, uh, what they gave these facts, people were ringing up and asking whether it's an April Fool's joke. But it is true. So, why does that happen? Slippers and shoes, they float upside down. So their soles are on the surface. So that when the wind acts, the shape that means that they go in opposite directions. So naturally, they get sorted into left and right because of their shape. And that's how some of them act in different places. So now I'm going to again give you a little bit of a demonstration of these various things that we have been talking about. Here we have the coastline again. So this is all Perth. This is that island that I was talking about. And let's say that we have a line of particles. Let's say a ship went through and dropped, or it was um, spilling oil all the way. But I'm actually going to say the oil is re non reactive. Right? So now we're going to say, okay, what happens if we have the currents? So that's our initial line, and then our particles move. So you actually have one current going southwards the other current going in the opposite direction and now these particles are taken away. Okay, so now say we only have the wind. So now the wind is blowing, you can see the arrows and these particles are moving in the direction of the wind. And now I'm going to combine the two, the currents only and the, way, uh, and the wind. And when I do that, The media is unavailable. Okay, I can't show you. So, but what that means is that a lot of those particles would have ended up on the beach. All right. So now, hopefully this might work. Rather than that line, I'm going to have a little blob. And here, nope. All right. I'm sorry, I can't show you that. All right, so now we go back. So, I will tol told you that we actually use this for different reasons and different applications. So, this is again, now you recognize Western Australia, and this is turtles. Turtles in Australia live in the warm water here, but we have a very strong current which brings these turtles washed away and they get uh, found on the beaches. And when they, when they basically end up on the beaches, they're sick, they have no energy, so the local authorities rehabilitate them and they want to release them back into the wild. And they release them over here. So obviously the first thing you want to know is that when to release them, that they don't end up in the same place that they found. So we actually did a study to say, well, if you release them out here in summer, there's a possibility that they may come out here. In autumn, definitely. In winter, most likely. But if you release them in spring, most likely they are going to end up in that particular winter. So by using these techniques, we can actually say, well, okay, you have a, a, a turtle which has been rehabilitated. We're gonna release them in this particular location and uh, we'll get them uh, not coming down here. So, the next application that I'm going to show you is a, 
a coastal engineering application. So you can think about Port City. Okay. So here, this Fremantle is about 200 kilometers to the south. And this is what this system looked like. Here, we actually have a marina. You can see these breakwaters. We have a, a residential areas, a canal estate. So, and this is sort of the Australian dream. So the Australian dream is that you want to have a million dollar house and you want to park your boat in your backyard. So these ones are basically million dollar properties. So the idea when this was built is that they built this breakwater, it would, the sand was going from uh, left to right here, and then the sand would actually accumulate at that location, and when they built it, they put pipelines underneath the system so that the sand could be pumped from one side to the other. All perfect coastal engineering practice. Okay. So, it didn't work. So it didn't work, and I'll show you in a minute. We actually had a lot of accumulation here. That sand was coming inside the marina, was tilting this up. None of this sand was getting over here, and these beaches were eroding, and they had to protect roads and houses in the system. So, these are some of the pictures in here, and you can see this uh, uh, material going through, and here you actually can see in the aerial view. What you also see is that out here, you see a lot of empty lots. Because the problem started, the developer could not sell the houses, the developer went bankrupt. So, which meant the government had to now step in to try to solve this problem. So the problem is this, this mass. This mass is dead seaweed. We call it seaweed rack. It's 40,000 tons of it gets accumulated. Okay. And you will actually see that. And what you don't notice when you actually show a picture like this that you can't smell it. It decomposes and it's basically hydrogen sulfide uh, gas, which is way beyond World Health Organization standards. So, these people here had been living for 50 years in their houses and then they came and built this and they basically have a health hazard. In. They can't use the beach. They have, so what they had to do, because the system was not working, is to put in um, earth movers and actually physically, mechanically clean this every year. And you can see here, they're all empty lots, which you can't actually see. So, if I was here, and I was actually going through here on the beach, and that's what you would see me to paint. That is a person. And that's along that line. Okay. So, the government had no choice. The developer had bankrupt. So they came to us to say, can you redesign the system to solve this problem? So, the seagrass rack that we see is something like that. So, you might be nice and green, like that. And they might die in time, and they will basically lie on the seabed, and when a storm comes, they end up on the beach. Okay. Now, we didn't know anything about these systems. We wanted to know, we didn't know how they move. All we knew was that this rack, so this dead seaweed, was on the beaches from May to October, and they disappeared in October, November except where those structures were, where they were trapped. So we didn't know. Did they move along the seabed? Did they float? Or they go at suspension? How quickly do they settle through the water column? How did they actually move 
from the system. So, you know, in all of the systems that we look at science, everything happens by accident, right? Just like Socrates was having his bath and he said, Eureka, he never actually looked at how buoyancy was the explanation. So, in most of these, it's the case. So, it's a good example of a settling velocity. So, settling velocity is basically how quickly does these leaves fall through the water column. So, very studiously, we went to the field, we brought a whole lot of samples, put it in this long tube, put it on the top, they didn't fall. They basically floated. So, scratching the head and starting to figure out what's going on. And this is a true story. It was done by a student. It was a Friday afternoon. Of course, he was not very happy. He went to the pub. And he comes back Monday morning. All the leaves were on the bottom. So, now, now we have to solve what happened between Friday and, of course, the sea leaves. The seaweed didn't go to the pub, right? So, what happened was that when the seaweed leaves were dry, they would float. When they actually got waterlogged, they would fall down. So, we did all of these studies. Remember, what we want to do is to take a particle, a parcel of water. Imagine that in, in what we're looking at and say, we're going to simulate. We're going to now say, this is how a piece of particle, these type of particles, a dead seaweed, this is how it's going to behave. So what we did is to say, okay, we then figured out that in terms of the, in the summer, these seaweed basically get accumulated. And when we have a storm, they basically get onto the beach and they also get moved along the beach. But there is only a limited supply. So when the supply uh, uh, was exhausted, no more was coming, and that's why it was looked as if it was naturally removed, because there's nothing more coming onto the beach. So to now to show you this in terms of conception, so imagine we have a piece of seaweed, and we may have a storm, a wave comes up, it resuspends, it moves uh, uh, along the beach. Remember, we've got currents, stoke drifts. I told you before about how the waves transport the material. And then the storm surge comes up, it will actually get onto the beach. And then the storm surge water level will go down, and this particle will remain. More particles will come in, it will dry out, it will accumulate, and it will be harder to remove as well. So we program all of these things into the particle. So the next uh, storm comes, it gets uh, resuspended, it actually uh, goes along the surface, and then with time it will go back. So we put all of that system, and now we're going to... So what we want to do is try to take this system and to make sure that we don't have accumulation, we have the sand also ending up on the other side. So this is what we came up with. You can see the difference between them. So now I'm going to show you how our particles that we use to simulate this system. So this is the original system and each one of those dots is a particle. And what you will see is a storm come through and they move very quickly with time. And I'm going to start the next one. It's going to look at exactly the same time, and this one is going to be now with our system. You can see here, a lot of the seaweed is moving. These are being trapped in this system. So they go both ways because of the storm. You can see some of the seaweeds also ending up, and now you actually have all sorts of uh, problems in that system. In here, what you will see with time is that you would still see the accumulation of the seaweed, but because we don't have the trapping event, they're actually being moving along the beach, and where there is each storm will move it along.
Okay. So this is what it looks like just after it was. So the government accepted our recommendations uh, two years ago, the construction, say the reconstruction, and it cost $27 million. It was twice as much as it cost originally to, to build the system. So what you see here is absence of the rack on this side, and you can see on this side the beaches are much wider. So to give you an example, we can't actually stop that weed coming ashore. So this was just uh, cup, uh, cup last week, about a month ago. So here we actually see looking uh, from this breakwater, we're actually looking at this area now. So yes, a storm has brought the um, seaweed onto the beach, and with time, the next storm comes along, you can see how that storm has basically taken that away. Okay. So it had, so the storms are now taken it, and now if I look at on the other side, so we're going to look at this beach now, originally nice and clean to a certain extent, and then that seaweed from the other side starts coming onto the system. So give you an application of the same thing that we use for a whole number of different applications. Okay, so this one um, I really like because it basically highlights the different connectivity. So you all recognize Sri Lanka and you see that little red dot at the bottom. And that red dot has 50,000 particles. And I'm going to run this for one year. So we start at the end of August, at the end, towards the end of the southwest monsoon, when the currents are going from west to east. And then you will see that the uh, currents will change to the response to the monsoon, and they will go in the opposite direction, and they will also come back in the opposite direction when the so off it goes, and remember that little dot has 50,000 particles, they look as if they're moving at the same time, and then basically in the Andaman Islands, it runs aground. And now it's releasing all of those, and now you see where these particles are going. Now the northeast monsoon, you actually see these eddy systems, now they're actually going past Maldives, and so this is the north East monsoon going in the opposite direction. We're coming to March, April. We are in the intermonsoon period. And now, very soon, you will see the monsoon starting. You can see the monsoon's already started on here. And all of this system is now going in the opposite direction. So most of them is going past Sri Lanka, the small dips. And now we are almost coming to the end. So, if you now look at where we started off from, that little dot to the south of Sri Lanka, we end up most of India, Burma, Thailand, Indonesia, and then most of Sri Lanka, Maldives, and Somalia. So this is basically how the currents are moving different materials which are on the surface. They're passive, they don't react with anything, but you can see that there is a lot of movement and dispersion and the spread of these systems. Okay, so time that you're all waiting for. MH370. So, disappeared on 8th of March 2014 and basically departed at um, Kuala Lumpur. It was heading to Beijing, uh, they basically are, uh, uh, sorry, it started here, and then last message was here, it was lost off the radar here. Initially, they basically said this might be the actual part of the system. So, <clears throat> first of all, what I have to tell you is that this Obviously, you know, it is a, a unique situation. Nobody has ever sort of lost a plane. And 
they always go about experience that they have had before. So the biggest experience they had that they based on was the Air France crash of Brazil a few years earlier. So that particular plane, they knew exactly where it disappeared. They went to the site, they found debris. But even if they found the debris on, debris on the surface, it took another two years for them to actually find the, the wreck on the bottom of the ocean. But the important thing that they learned from that system, because they knew exactly where the debris was, after 18 days, they did not find any debris at all. So that was a guiding principle in the search for the MF370, that they did not expect to find any debris after 18 days. So, they've or originally they started their search in the South China Sea here, and then they moved it to the Andaman Sea. And then they said, no, nope, it ended up in the South Indian Ocean. They first said it was in this region here, Area 1. Then they said, no, nope, it was in Area 2. And then they said it was in Area 3. When they first started looking in Area 3, it was day 17. Remember the day, 18 days, is when they said debris will not be found. Not only that, during that period, between when the plane disappeared and when the, uh, they started the uh, search here, there were two tropical cyclones which went through that area. So, in officially, they did not expect to find any debris at all. So, I, again, contrary to how the introduction, I don't actually have an official capacity in the search for the MH370. When they moved the search to, to the, this region, I was sitting in an airport in Adelaide, and this reporter rang me up and said, this plane has now changed here, what do you think about this area? And I said, well, it's the Roaring Forties, it's deep, it's cold, it's very rough, that's all I said. So he put it in the online thing, and by now, three hours later when I landed, I have like 50 odd calls, which is missed. When I landed, everybody wanted to talk to me about these conditions over here. So then, it basically came up and I realized that I could do a lot more in terms of the skills that we have. So, I told you one guiding principle that we had was that 18 days, after 18 days you will not find any debris. Second one is the only information that they received was from the geostationary satellite in Inmarsat, which is sort of directly about 500 kilometers directly above that point, and it was basically receiving a ping from the engines. And there were seven pings. And the ping means that you know the distance between the satellite and the aeroplane in a circle. So it couldn't have gone to the other side because it, the plane couldn't have gone that fast or didn't have fuel to get that far. So that's the line. So each of that is a ping, and then the seventh one here is called the seventh R. And when it actually received that last one is when it did not receive any more. So that's called the seventh R. You can see the seventh R here, and that's that line. So, and that is the only evidence that we have that the plane went along in that region. Okay, so the Australian and Malaysian and Chinese, they basically, they defined this as the search area and they looked and said, well, that red box is the area where it most likely would have come from. So you can actually see those yellow bits are the ones that they're actually looking at and have surveyed in the system. They did some statistical modeling as well and said that's so the white line is the seventh arc. They actually looked 
is the side of it and they said most likely it's going to be in that area which is highlighted in red and so Fugro which is a commercial company got the contract so they tore a uh, an echo sounder like uh, a fish much below the surface and it basically maps the seabed at a very high resolution so that's the tow fish and, and this is what they are looking at in terms of the search so then you probably know they're coming to the end of looking at that whole um, area that I had highlighted so this yellow bit and in April they basically had something the area of the size of Sri Lanka to cover okay. so I would like you to just imagine what the the tasks that we have so imagine that you are the the water depth here is four kilometers imagine that you're in a helicopter four kilometers in the air and you're traveling at around 15 kilometers an hour and you've got your eyes closed and you want to cover every single inch of the landmass of Sri Lanka so that's what they have been doing and that's what they've been trying to do since so helicopter is easy because it's not going up and down there is no wind there is no weather conditions and waves okay. so it is a very very slow process to map this whole area okay so our initial ones we said okay if we actually had that's our seventh arc this is on the uh, southern part with the, there was a French satellite said we found all of this debris in these locations so we could actually predict again how the uh, that the these uh, areas would come uh, within the the debris fields in that region similarly in a different way we can do forward and backwards etc so one of our predictions we said we would actually have it here and that would be the path of the debris and so the ocean circulation in the ocean basins is the currents basically go around this large eddy system or a gyre so this was around August 2014 but three months after the plane had disappeared <coughs> and of course nobody would be any interest at all on this figure <coughs> because first of all they said after 18 days you will not find any debris and the interest from the press and everybody has basically waned so we did this prediction 12 months before they found the flapper oil at that particular location so we presented this at a conference and it basically laid there can't be but about six weeks before the flaperon was found in Reunion Island, the Australian search people said most likely the debris will end up in Sumatra. So they went against their first things to say no debris would be found. They said, but then suddenly they announced that it would be found in Java. And I looked at that and said, well, that can't be possible because you can see how anything comes along here gets swept away by this very strong current which originates in the north of Australia and that's called the South Equatorial Current so it cannot actually cross that system so now the search parties are saying the debris would end up here and they were looking down here and we have this paper buried in scientific literature and then the flaperon happened. So the flaperon is this little piece which ended up in Reunion Island. And if I go back to that picture that I showed you, we actually found that's where we thought it may end up in. These are basically um, 
colors depicting time. So blue is six months, green is six to 12 months, etc., etc. So reunion here. And they, are you all very lucky to be not colorblind? Can you see all the colors in there? But this is actually not the proper way to show pictures. I was told by the BBC that that is the proper way. So if you look at the BBC website, if you're colorblind, that's the best way to describe your system. Okay. So, now, everybody was ringing me because I had predicted 12 months before that the debris was going to end up in Reunion Island. The Australian said the official Australian output was in Sumatra. So obviously everybody now is rerunning their models and finding out and then very sheepishly the ATSB put out a press release saying that they had, act, they had put the wrong wind into their model. That's why they all ended up in Sumatra. But physically it shouldn't have happened because if you know the oceanography it would never have ended up in that location. So that's the, the seventh arc that they're looking at, and they basically ended up in that location. But then we can actually say, well, now we actually got a piece of debris. We could try to see how long does it take for that debris to end up in the Eastern Indian Ocean, sorry, uh, the Western Indian Ocean, and what location. So that's our seventh arc. We basically, each one of those little pins, we did a simulation. So, and this was also when the flaperon was found. It was big news all over the world, and everybody obviously won part of the pie, if you like. The director of the supercomputing center rang me up and said, you guys, do you want any more time on our supercomputer to do more simulations? We will help you, we will give you programmings, etc. I said, yeah, great, give us some more. So, so we were basically able to manage to do a lot more of these simulations. So, I'm going to start, I'm going to basically show you those four. If we started at the bottom end, so that's the, the bottom end of the seventh R, so it's here, and the 8th of March, if we release it here, when the flaperon was found, it didn't have time to get there. So in other words, the debris, if there was any, which would have only got there, it would not have got to the flaperon, to Reunion Island. That means that it could not have originated from much further south in that land. Then when we go a little bit north to that location, we see that yes, now we can actually find that debris approaching Reunion Island. Now, when we go a little bit further north, out here, we're definitely in our time scale. If we go right to the north, then it would have far, that flaperon would have ended up there maybe three to four months before it was found. Okay. So we could act now actually say, by looking at where it basically comes from, that we are, where they're looking at, we could maybe discount the southern part, but more on the middle part is where the debris may have originated. Okay, so about a month after this flaperon was found, this guy called Blaine Gibson came to my office and he was basically, he's a, a lawyer from the US and uh, he took an interest in trying to find areas where there could be debris. So we sat in my office and we looked at all of these maps and things like that and so he said, where would I go to find more debris? So I said, most likely, when we're looking at these maps like this, Madagascar or Mozambique. Yeah. 
So he told me, he said, look, I've been to Madagascar on holiday a long time ago, but maybe I'll go to Mozambique. And what did he do? He went there within two days, he found another piece of debris in Mozambique. So that's the piece that he found and that has been confirmed to be coming from MX370. A little bit earlier than that, they actually pictured this in South Africa. You can see all the, the biofouling and then that, the same piece came back and you can see the Rolls Royce and this was also defined in the system. So blame is a very um, resourceful and persistent person. And in May, he rang me from Maldives. He said, you know, I'm in Maldives um, because there has been sightings of the MH370 in the Maldives. And so I have been talking to the local people. I'm walking the beaches in Maldives, but I haven't found anything. So now I'm going to go back to the Western Indian Ocean. And he said, where should I go? I said, I have the choice of going into Rodriguez, Mauritius, Madagascar, Mozambique, and South Africa. I said, your best bet is to go to Madagascar. So here, so that's uh, Mozambique, where he actually found it. That's Reunion Island. So these have now been extended to cover a two-year period. And what does he do? He goes to Madagascar, and I told him to go to the northern part here, and he finds another piece of the debris. Okay. What a fluke I can get. And now, has been confirmed as yet, this is only about three weeks ago that this piece was found. And then, a little bit later, they found this piece in Pemba Island in Tanzania, which is out here. See this red box? Uh, blob here, and that's Raika Beach, seems to be an area of accumulation of debris, and then you actually see this debris going along the coast, ending up in Pemba Island. So, to give you a little flavor of sort of how this debris might be moving, so if we end up here, we are now releasing um, uh, debris and in this movie I'm only showing 10 days pathways of a particular piece of the debris. So you can actually see little snakes so they basically uh, disappear after 10 days so you actually see the tracks for 10 days. You can see the circulation is that way and there's a net movement of the water from east to west and you actually have these ones going. You can see lots of eddies and they go round and round, they stay in one place for a long time and now obviously it's the time, two years, two and a half years that they're actually now ending up on the Western Indian Ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doctor. I'm sure that all of you found it as interesting as I did. So, this is the time to get something bit more out of the uh, on various aspects that we have to know. Most of you that is uh, really that is very hard. So, I can see. No, I can see. Okay, that's all. So, time is open for you now to raise any questions or ask any questions. Can I start the all rolling first? Yeah. 
that 18 day thing that you mentioned at the beginning. Now, is it just a conjecture or is it proven by you as this thing has any meaning? With evidence of one sample. <laughs> That's right, because you never talked about 18 days afterwards. Yeah. So that was, but that was their mindset. Oh, I see. Yeah. So they never expected to find anything. Oh, right. So even if they actually said their models ended up in Sumatra, they were saying it, but they didn't really believe that there would be anything would end up. So now, uh, is the search still going on? Who can find the depth? The, the search is still going on. Um, at the moment, as I said, they're going to cover that yellow bit yeah, that yeah, I talked yeah. about. And at the moment, they plan that it would be finished around about end of August. And the three countries, which is China, Malaysia, and Australia, have decided that they will not continue. But they also say, unless there's compelling evidence. Okay, anybody else would like to raise any questions? I explained it so well, <laughs> uh, you don't have no questions. Um, no, I don't know. Some people always ask me that question. Um, there is no explanation for the Bermuda Triangle. There is no such a thing here, definitely. Sorry, you explained that it's saving? They're actually looking. So what they're mapping is to find the fuselage or uh, other, you know, the the debris field per se. But what is the probability of uh, finding it in that localized area? Pretty, pretty high. Um, well, I mean, can I take your uh, question one step back. What has been interesting is that, except for that last piece that was in Tanzania, all the other pieces have been either of engines or pieces of the wing. So that made you conjecture that maybe the way that it crashed, most of the fuselage was intact, it's still on the bottom of the ocean. And that could also indicate that we talked about the 18 days, but there was still maybe the fuselage is still intact, that it didn't release any debris to say. And so that's one thing. But where what they're looking for is basically abnormalities on the seabed. And and through the sonar they're trying to pick out various things. So they found lots of volcanoes and old shipwreck and, and various other things. And uh, so they're but not the MH370. What you also have to remember that when they started looking, you know, I, I told you even with the Air France, they knew the debris, they found the debris, they knew where it disappeared, but it still took two years to actually locate the debris. In the water. If you take the case of the Titanic, it took 100 years to find the final resting place. So I sort of think that most likely they will stop this year and look back and maybe reassess. Good to have a little review. And I think that there probably be maybe a commercial. Uh, you have to remember also that, you know, when MH, two years ago, there were only two vehicles in the world which could have done this work. Couldn't go down to 4,000 meters. There wasn't anything in the world, only two. One was by Woods Hole and the other one by French. It's the only two vehicles who could go down to 4,000 meters. That was my next question So what's yeah. going to happen is that suddenly people realize that we don't have capacity to look at the deep ocean. 
So I think that the technology is going to improve. We would have better ways to actually map the seabed. So they will ultimately find it with the increase in technology and more better ways of looking at these. But on the other hand, if we can go down to the Mariana Trench, then this is piece of cake compared to that. Yeah. But Mariana Trench, they didn't, they went down and came up. Right? So you went down and you came back. You didn't do any mapping. You didn't actually look to see what was in the Mariana Trench or whatever. They just went to 10,000 meters and then they came back. Yes, it is an achievement, but here we are looking at moving and looking at an area of the size of Sri Lanka or more. Right? What I was left was the, in April to cover was the size of Sri Lanka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry? The um, from what I have read, um, they they looked at the area where the debris was, and they concentrated on that particular area. And they did the sort of the same thing. After about one or two, uh, I think about 18 months, they stopped looking. And then they got a lot of people together. They looked at the same area and then came up with different models to looking at where it may have gone down. And it was only about 30 kilometers away. But there was a, um, I think, an underwater mountain range. And it was on the other side where they were not looking, I suppose. It's hindsight is always a good thing. The software we use is just open, open access. You can do exactly what we do. So we take um, global models and we put that into particle models, particle tracking, and then we interpret it. Sorry? Well, then, uh, are you catchers immediately after the uh, vaccine that they open? As I told you, when, we, when they got there, it was 18 days after, after two tropical cyclones. So if there was anything, they would have gone completely by then. Could the shape or the size of the debris affect the way the Well, we don't actually distinguish how big they are how small. But I told you the three things that we looked at. One is the windage, how far it is sticking out of the water, but, and then how uh, the waves and the currents are taken. So our assumption in all of these ones is to say there is no windage, or very small amount of windage. So it doesn't matter how big or small they are, because what we're doing is that we have a parcel of water, and the debris is in it. And we are saying that the debris and the water is all moving together. So it might be a really big piece or a really small piece. It doesn't matter because they're all going at the same speed. So it doesn't matter, like, even though, say, something like on land, it was something that's taking longer to try and move. Heavier, it's if a lot of, if um, there was, let's say, um, there was a little dinghy of here that came across and ended up in Madagascar. But it went upside down. So its whole journey, it would have gone on the surface. And the wind would have taken it. So if you take that case, the bigger the amount of the boat sticking out, 
would have gone it much farther because the wind would be at you. But in the water, it doesn't really matter. This is the first one. I think a lot of people want to know, can it happen again? Right. And um, so, and, and unfortunately it will end up that you and I who fly will be basically be paying a little bit more for our tickets. So one of the things that they are uh, looking at, you know, the only information that they have now is that pings. So now they have a system they're tracking every plane. At least each airline has a system to say, we want to know at any given time what our plane is. So that's, uh, I don't know whether every airline does it, but most of the major airlines are doing that. Secondly, in the international civil aviation authorities, they want to actually uh, say, you know, we are in a dig digital age why should still be putting material into a black box right. and then wait for a plane to crash and go and find it? Why can't we basically transmit that data in real time all the time? So they want to develop that, but that would actually mean bandwidth, a whole lot of other things, you know. But it's possible in our age. So what, you know, when we actually say, in, in, in every single disaster, I mean, it's always hindsight that we try to come back to do it. If you look at the tsunami, we want to do a tsunami warning system that only happened after it. So you can actually go, you can actually say here, we had floods a few years ago. You could basically, you know, oh, what went wrong? You said, oh, it rained a lot. But that is not an answer to say it rained a lot. We should be prepared to be able to cope with that kind of system. So in hindsight, we say, well, what should we have done? So this is the same case. I mean, when you actually think about it, what we do on our mobile phones, we can, you know, my, I have an app on my phone. I can basically follow every single plane in the world which is in the air. So why can't all of this can be included into the system and try to write it into a black box? Right. I mean, it doesn't make sense in this memory and things like that. But for that to happen, it also needs a lot more work. So it might be two or three years before they actually convert all of the flight recorders to be real-time data. Can you go back to the first flight for the second? The Sri Lanka one? This one? The fourth one, I guess. The fourth. Yeah. Now, here you see that the jet radar data is used to provide this information. Uh, I wonder uh, this this we have, that Sri Lanka have a one uh, surface wave high frequency radar. You know that? In Hidari. We have a high frequency surface wave radar station. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Do you know what frequency? Do you know what frequency? Uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, it's been used for some other purpose. I wonder now, uh, we were tracking the tsunami waves from this one. So, can this radar be used for these kind of oceanographic uh, studies? So, depending on the frequency. You have only one, right? Okay. So the systems that we have, they, uh, so usually if you have one radar system, it will basically tell you the currents coming towards you or away from you. So you need two to give the vectors. But it also needs to be a, a particular frequency because you need to have the drag, drag scattering. So in Australia, I run this system. We have 12 of those. Around the show. My target 
is, is basically to confirm that they are, from an oceanography point of view, that the area that they're looking at is consistent with the information from the oceanography. They bring finally to confirm that the tragedies happened? See, <laughs> um, yes and no. So, in any system or model and things like that, we have an error bar. So the big error bar here is the whole of the seventh arc. And they can't actually map cover the whole area. So if we can narrow, so the, the simulations that we did along that whole line allows to, to narrow the area of the search. We can't, from the oceanography or any of the information that we have, pinpoint exactly where it is. If you do, it would have been found a long time ago. So it is the inherent error in the system, and that's called nature. And is there an end date of this search project? Sorry? Is there an end date of this Yeah, 31st of August. The current budget runs out, and the current contract runs out as part of the budget. Uh, let me ask a different question, not to do with the yep. MSQ. I was very uh, intrigued by your the, the accumulation of uh, this thing. So, I, you know the audience of the here, which has faced a lot of questions about the Port City and the yep. Red Corner. Have you looked at that at much? Uh, yeah. Um, well, first of all, you're lucky you don't have CV. <laughs> So you don't actually have the sand. Um, the, the, the first thing that you have to remember is that irrespective of you build Port City or not, the biggest influence on the sand transport on the environmental system in this area is the Colombo South Lake Port. Already there. So it's already there. So unless you don't want to build, take it down, so all of the ones that they're talking about, for example, they're saying there, there would be erosion north of Kalani, some maybe to the south. That's going to happen irrespective yes. of ports. Okay. Then someone asked me the other day, or oh, the fishermen are claiming that the fish are going to be affected and their land is hurt. That's not going to happen. Again, the circulation has changed from all the system, system. Yeah. but you know, that I, I don't think anybody even know the area that they're going to reclaim. Is that a nursery area for fish? Is there a habitat area for fish? You know, there's no, no concrete thing that you can actually say. So you can always blame things and say, somebody built something and it affected. So, so in, if you look at that picture, you would actually have that. So Port City is going to be built on the shadow part. You will not have a uh, in 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 that intent. But it's a, it has design flaws. It has problems with uh, some of the sedimentation issues, um, and it will have the same problem that I was talking to you about that I didn't actually talk to you about on that system that I talked about uh, the seaweed problem. There, were, there are two problems. The one is the entrance. The other is the water quality in the canals. And with these canal systems, the water quality will um, diminish with time. There is no exchange. So what happens is that it doesn't happen in the first few years. It will be after four or five, maybe ten years. So in in Australia, for example, in Queensland, New South Wales, and Tasmania, they have banned these because they all have exactly the same problem. Where water, you know, it's, it's, it's a classic one. Somebody builds a system, a developer, private developer, they make the money by selling the land. After five years, they're gone. Right? 
So then they have the problem in the system. So one part of the problem, so, but it's not limited to Australia or here. A good example, they don't actually talk about it, is everybody says, oh, how good is Dubai? Right? And Dubai has the palms, and all of those arms have problems with water quality of the exchange. So that's going to be one issue that they will have. And what will also happen here is that we don't have a big pipe, so the water will not move in and out. And the second one that you would also have is that from what I can gather, they're going to build a lot of high rises. So you're not going to have the effect of the wind as, as, as well. So those are, those are the issues that you... But the big ones that they're talking about are the non-issues. I have one uh, question with regard to the application of the uh, subject. Uh, in renewable energy, uh, harnessing of uh, idle bears to, to, for renewable energy is a problem here. Do you or have you done any work or are there any applications of oceanographic credit columns in terms of finding probably the best areas in authorities? Have you done any work or is there? Yeah. I mean, we do that all the time. Um, so we, in Western Australia, in fact, just off that island is about the only operational wave energy plant in the world uh, called Carnegie. So we do a lot of the predictions for them and things like that. Um, but you're, you're, you're mechanical engineers, right? Yeah. So the, the issue with the, um, uh, okay, you, you know about wind power and what it looks like. You basically got these big windmills. But in the tidal ones, what they want to do, rather than building these tidal lagoons, they basically want to have the same system underwater, underwater. big propellers with the big turbines. Right. So one of the things that I do is that I try to measure turbulence in the water. And then I went and I was talking to one of my colleagues and they said, ah, you know, he was doing exactly the same, but for the renewable energy. And I asked him, I said, what is the relationship between the turbulence? He said, ah, what you don't know is that we still have not been able to make a propeller which will last long enough without breaking due to turbulence. So it's not really the oceanography, it's still trying to get the technology right to work in the uh, harsh marine environment. You have lots of theories and lots of things that actually say yes you can actually do this but the problem more is actually practically doing it. You always predict exactly where you put a really nice tidal system to generate power but to keep it going is the difference. I'm glad that people picked up after a while <laughs> that all this effects. So, anyway. Yeah, anybody, anybody thinking of a late question before we wind up? Well, in that case, uh, I would like to invite Thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for a very, very interesting lecture. A formal vote of thanks. I like that. Um, on behalf of the uh, Mechanical Engineering Section of Committee, I would like to thank uh, Professor Charita Patiarachi for that insightful lecture on uh, oceanography and its applications on solving uh, probably one of the biggest mysteries in uh, modern aviation, finding image 370. So thank you very much, sir. And also on behalf of the MESC, I would like to thank the IESL uh, staff. Uh, without their help, we would be able to put this evening together. And also, uh, let me take the opportunity to thank the uh, MESC committee who organizes these lectures, Asita, and also Mr. Parakrama and uh, Mr. Sandanaga for putting this together. And uh, last but not least, uh, let me thank the lovely audience for joining us for today evening's lecture. Um, and before that, I would like to. Uh, 
call upon Mr. Parak from Jaisinger to present this uh, token of appreciation to uh, Professor for joining us this evening. Right, with that, uh, we are wrapping up uh, tonight's lecture. Good night, everyone.